A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery and sometimes the misery of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, my guest is Pascal Finette. He's the only one in the world. Pascal is Singularity University's Chair for Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation. He is the co-founder and enfant terrible of Radical Ventures, which he explains what that means. His work focuses on the intersection of technology, entrepreneurship, culture, and global impact. Pascal has founded a series of startups, and he has a deep background in technology, including being on the internet before web browsers. He led eBay's Platform Solutions Group in Europe. He held leadership positions at Mozilla, and he's helped build startups. Pascal has written a book called The Heretic, Daily Therapeutics for Entrepreneurs, and has blogged and written a newsletter for a long time, more than 1,200 posts. In this interview, he shares a lot of what he's seen in the world of technology, what's on the horizon, how our world will be different from these disruptive exponential technologies that are coming down the pike, things that are already transforming our world, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, 3D printing, autonomous driving, gene editing, and so on. He talks about the importance of a purpose for your organization and the difference between a purpose and a mission. He also walks through a simple framework to help you articulate yours in a very clear, compelling, powerful way. We go deep into his methods to prepare and deliver really powerful messages from the stage, things that I'm not sure how many lifetimes I would live before they occurred to me, but fortunately, uh, I learned them in this interview with Pascal. Pascal, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be uh, on this uh, on this podcast uh, podcast with you. Yeah, I'm so glad to reconnect with you. Pascal, I want to ask you the question I start every podcast with, which is this. What's life about? <laughs> uh, just starting with the smallest possible question you can ask. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I tend to believe that life is probably about growth and growing. Um, and uh, that's probably a very nature-inspired uh, answer, but I believe that it also transcends and translates into the human sphere. So let, let's give it that short at, like, I believe life is about growth. Okay, beautiful. And that might explain why we get along so well. I, have, I share that. Now, I'm very interested to understand a bit more about you. I understand that you frequently speak and write, and I had the chance to hear you speak in Macau I was blown away. Um, I loved what I heard. And I know you speak and write a lot about the magic that happens at the intersection of entrepreneurship, culture, technology, and global impact. But when you're introduced before you go on stage, or maybe when you meet someone afterwards, you know, for cocktails or discussion, how do you like to be described? Or how do you think about yourself? How do you describe or introduce yourself? (laughs) I typically don't. Uh, I just don't take myself all that all that serious. And uh, quite frankly, I love uh, in a conversation. I actually rather be not be introduced and just start to listen and uh, hear what other people have to say. I'm I'm uh, very driven by curiosity and uh, understanding and and learning about other people. Um, so I'd rather have you not introduce myself, <laughs> but let me lurk around and listen and then you know, start to slowly grow into a conversation. Yeah. Now, on your website, you call yourself or someone uses the, the verbiage enfant terrible. I'm sure my pronunciation is a little horrible there, but maybe you can explain what that is and why that's on, on the site there. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, so the enfant terrible was uh, is a is a term used. It's a French term, of course. It translates into the terrible child, um, and it's uh, it's a term used for um, uh, heretical thinkers, particularly in the art um, in the arts. Uh, you know, it's an old French term, and I like to think about myself as a little bit of a rebel rouser, as a heretic, as a someone who's kind of taking a contrarian view to most people's view. Um, I also love to the, play the game of devil's advocate, so kind of like looking at things from different perspectives. I'm also really only uh, out of a, a personal interest to see and understand things a little bit more contextual and understand them from multiple angles. So um, the short story is why I have this weird title is um, we founded this company, uh, my wife and I, uh, called Be Radical, which is a little advisory consultancy firm. Um, and quite frankly, I don't just don't give a damn about titles. I really don't. And we needed titles, like because people ask you for your damn title. They're like, "So what do you do?" And I'm like, "Well, I co-founded this thing." They're like, "Yeah, but what do you do?" And I'm like, "Oh God, okay. Let me give you a title, but you have no idea what it is. <laughs> it kind of sounds cool. It makes a lot of sense if you actually understand what it means, but it really doesn't mean anything." So uh, that's where Enfant Terrible comes from, at yeah. least for me. Well, and your newsletter and your first book, The Heretic. Um, you just talked a little bit about that, about the contrarian, looking at things from a different point of view. Um, tell me a little bit about your first book, The Heretic Daily Therapeutics for Entrepreneurs, and your second book that I know you're in the middle of writing now. What I wonder is if there's a common audience for these. In other words, who did you write these books for? Who do you write for? And what do you want your writing to do for them? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Um, so... Very briefly, I spent all my career um, basically at this really interesting intersection of um, either starting and running my own things or working for some of the really bigger, more interesting tech companies um, in management and leadership positions. And uh, I, I see myself and really feel as an entrepreneur at heart. You know, I grew up in an entrepreneurial uh, family. My dad was an entrepreneur, uh, ran his own company. What kind and of work did he do? Uh, he was actually an engineer, so very, very different. It's in in a lot of ways, very different than I uh, than my chosen career path. Um, also, very informative because I I really you know having grown up with seeing my dad run his company and like, being part of that company for a little bit, uh, I knew that I didn't want to do that kind of work. Um, so he's in the in the construction industry. In in construction, and where, and where did you grow up? Where were you having these experiences? I, I originally grew up in Germany, so I was born in Cologne. Uh, I spent my formative years in Berlin, uh, which is uh, probably the best place you can spend your formative years, especially briefly after the wall came down and like you're seeing all this kind of craziness, right? So I highly recommend go to Berlin today, but uh, imagine how Berlin was 20, 30 years ago. Um, yeah, so the, the audience for The Heretic became effectively, uh, it was originally a newsletter uh, which i send out literally pair uh, via like just email so not as a newsletter subscription but literally me sending emails to my friends and uh, they were mostly just the, my musings about what happens in the world of entrepreneurship particularly tech entrepreneurship so your classic world of startups um, and what the newsletter allowed me to do was um, at the time, I was building uh, the first global accelerator program for Mozilla, the five makers of the Firefox web browser, and it allowed me to reflect on a lot of the, the stuff I absorbed. So I read or uh, learned from interactions with other people, and I felt like it's, it's A, worth sharing, but B, it's also a way for me to just reflect on this. Um, and by forcing you to write it down, right, like the act of writing it down and making it concise... Um, there's a really interesting uh, learning experience in there. So I started out with that. Um, then a bunch of people said, like, hey, you should make this. I'm forwarding this to other people. Can you please, like, make this easier so I don't need to manually forward it, but can you please set up a newsletter? Um, so we set, set up originally um, uh, just a cheapo MailChimp newsletter thing. Um, then over time, uh, as the readership grew, um, we designed it a little bit, and um, that's basically what it still is. And the first book was um, effectively just my attempt to say, um, I've written at that time, I've written about, I think, the first 500 posts or so. And I thought, you know what? Like, 
Some are better than others, no question about it. And some are actually probably pretty good. So what happens if I were to curate the top, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 posts, um, kind of like really edit them. Um, so if someone look at them from an editorial perspective, edit them, curate them a little bit and put them into this little book. And uh, the intent for the book was really have it as a little bit of a coffee table book. So something you can pick up in the morning or, you know, whenever you feel you need a burst of inspiration or an insight, you read one of these stories. They're only like a page or two long. Uh, and then you just put it down and you read another one, you know, the next day. Um, so we did this and then we, we did... We went through the self-publishing route so because I wanted to understand how publishing works. Um, so we did all that. Um, and it was fun. It was a fun little project. Um, so that is the entrepreneurial side. So, I've, And I've been writing this newsletter for about seven years now. It has more than, I don't know, 1,200 posts or so now. It's, it's quite, a, quite the archive. And I continue doing this, but my, my interest shifted a little bit from early stage entrepreneurs, so the, the people who are building companies basically from the ground up, to really figuring out, um, and this is deeply influenced through the work we're doing with uh, Singularity University on you know, what the future of technology looks like, really got interested in what does this mean for legacy businesses? What does this actually all mean for businesses which are established? And if you think about the uh, economic consequences, if you think about where are people actually, for example, employed today, they're not employed in a garage startup. They're employed in a 500 people small and medium-sized business, you know, somewhere in the Midwest. Now, those companies get disrupted and they get sh their, their, their ground is shifting. So over the last couple of years, I got really fascinated in, t in the question of like, how can you help these companies? How can you make sense of the world for them? And out of that came the new book. And the new book then it allowed us to see the world in a different way. And we gained, I believe, a very unique insight into what this world will look like. And in the process, and I shut up in a second, but in the process, we came to this um, holy shit moment where um, I think we actually discovered a shift in the market, uh, which is mostly not being talked about um, and we which will shift very dramatically how companies are being run and built. And we can talk about this, of course, um, a little more. Um, and it affects both legacy businesses as it affects the ground, the ground they're standing on, as well as it affects the way you need to think about how you build a new business. So this, you're talking about the book that you're in the process now of finishing and, and publishing, mm -hmm. right? So tell me, if you will, um, and I know titles are these things that go like everything, they go through evolution. What's the, what's the title you're using? What's the working title, at least, for this book? So the internal title is uh, we're using is uh, The Future of Business. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, a, there's a subcontext which we call The Middle Goes Away mm -hmm. um, or The Rise of Hourglass Economics, which really describes the central thesis. Um, none of those titles are any good. <laughs> They're clearly not the title you want to put on a book which like you want to see in a bookstore, right? So... Uh, we trust, on this point, we trust the publishing industry uh, to figure out what it actually should be, uh, should be named. I don't yeah. need to be creative on that end. Yeah. No, and I do want, I want to come back to that in a moment. But I want to explore as well, like I've loved reading um, some of what you've written on, in The Heretic and, and online. And it's, it's interesting to me because it is a future focus you know, where you're looking ahead to what is coming. And we all know, I mean, we've all seen in the last decade major um, dis disruptions, for lack of a better term. Um, and I think you clearly see more than most from your vantage point, Singularity University's Chair for Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation and what you're doing with Radical Ventures and this. But also, I think, perhaps because of your curiosity and the way you scan the headlines from around the world every day. This was something I've, I'm sure you're not probably the only person on the planet doing it, but you're the only person I've ever heard of who approaches kind of an awareness and a consumption of media in the way that you do. Will you talk a little bit about your morning routine or what your process yeah, is? How sure. are you finding and process this information from around the world? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think I should preface this with, uh, this is a very peculiar way of, of, uh, digesting information and I think it has a lot to do with just with like just sheerly how my brain works um, so I think 
what I'm probably relatively good at is pattern recognition. So if I see a lot of data, if I see a lot of stuff, um, I see the patterns emerging coming out of it. Um, so, and I'm, I'm really bad at going into details, right? I'm really not like the person who's like reading the, like the two papers and really gets the information out of it. I need to read the headlines of a hundred papers and I kind of see what the big trends are. So I'm, I'm really more a generalist and like a 30,000 feet view person than a detailed person. So that uh, manifests itself in my media consumption. And um, uh, you mentioned, I, I keep telling this people, it's like, what I do is I scan um, uh, uh, using a feed reader um, a lot of news headlines, particularly out of the, the world of uh, technology and, and business as it intersects with technology. And I probably read about somewhere around a thousand headlines a day and make no mistake, I don't even read them, right? I, I, I just, like, they pass by me. And it doesn't take me all that long. It's probably, like, 20, 30 minutes of, like, daily habit. Um, but what happens is it's fascinating because you see certain headlines popping up over and over and over again, right? So, first of all, you see them on the day off where you see, well, if those five technology blogs all write about this particular thing, it might be important, and then you see it also over time where you see, oh, wait a second. So I saw this yesterday pop up in five technology blocks and today it's still in three and the day after it's still in three. And then it, you know, so you see both like the, the sheer volume as well as the uh, a longitudinal view on it. So it gives you a really good sense of what is what matters, at least in the eyes of the, the media, right? What matters and what is probably more like a blimp on the radar. Um, so that's the way I, I personally just like consume my information and, uh, it works really well for me. Clearly. And obviously you've been in this space of technology and, and on the leading edge of what's happening here for a long time. In fact, one thing I'm really curious to learn more about is that you got started on the net before web browsers existed, right? Uh, like, yes. <laughs> tell <laughs> us a little bit, me. like, how does that <laughs> happen? Uh, that dates me. Um, well, a couple of things happened. So first of all, uh, my my dad was very forward looking, uh, probably more accidental than knowingly, but um, he bought the first Macintosh in 1990, 1985. Um, we bought one of the very one of the first one thousand Macintosh which were delivered to Germany. Wow. Um, so. We saw this thing, you know, I originally saw the advertisement for it and I was like, oh my God, like I went to my dad and said like, you know, I had, I had, we had computers before. My dad bought me a Commodore 64 and a VIC-20 before that and so on. But I saw the Macintosh and I was like, dad, look at this thing. This is magic. You know, it's like graphical user interface, this tiny little box, you know, it was incredible. Uh, and uh, my dad looked at this and was you know, he knew the power of computers because he saw me like playing with computers, but he also knew that computers back in the day, they sucked because they ran Microsoft DOS, you know, and they were like unwieldy and nobody could use them. So he saw this thing and it was like, wow, this is cool. This is interesting. It could be different. Um, so I got into that, got sucked into this world really early. And then very early on, we also got a, um, uh, what was then called an acoustic coupler, uh, which is basically like a uh, a thing you plug your telephone line into, but like literally the, the telephone set, you plug it in there. Um, so we, uh, and then we get access to uh, bulletin boards, you know, like online bulletin boards and that kind of stuff. Um, so I got sucked into that world. And when you're in that world, you start to see like the beginnings of the internet. You just see them happening. And I just happened to um, to hang out in the computer club in my school and then later in my university and the tools we were using back in the day, and this is prior, really prior to the World Wide Web, um, was Gopher. Um, and for those of you who have never seen Gopher or heard of Gopher, um, Gopher is it basically the idea of Gopher is uh, imagine you have a, a pure text version of what the web looks like today. So you had already this ability to link to other stuff. Um, so uh, you could, via Gopher, I could go into the um, National Academy in the US. I can read an article about whatever the constitution and then it got it was linked to this other article about you know like the founding fathers and quite frankly i mean when i saw this i was like this is incredible this is like this is magic right this is a library but like an interactive library um so that's how i got sucked into into the world of gopher um 
And then we installed, I was on the team like, of volunteers in the uh, computer um, a resource center at my university back in Cologne. Uh, I was on the team which installed the first web browsers. So we installed you know, like an alpha version of uh, Netscape, um, the original Netscape um, browser. And before that, we actually installed NCSA Mosaic, which was a competing browser, uh, which was open source. And um, uh, just to give you an idea, is like, and just to like get the record straight here, how non-visionary I am. So I installed. I remember this very distinctly. I installed NCSA Mosaic, and like we, we, you open up the first kind of web pages, and I see this. And I mean, the web was pretty bare back then, right? There was not a lot of like stuff you could do. And I see this and I'm like, yeah, this is boring. I just go back to Gopher. I had not seen the ability, like, you know, pretty much at the, at the very same time, Jeff Bezos, you know, over in, in New York at the time, saw the same thing. And the, the thought here is like, oh, my God, this is going to change everything. I'm going to sell books on this thing, you know. <laughs> so clearly there's people with a vision and there's people who, are, who need to be kicked in the butt, backside to actually see it. I'm, I'm probably more on the latter. Well, I, I think your vision is, is pretty remarkable from what I've heard you talk about and what I've read you write. And you, you talk a lot about the fact that the future will look very different from today. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things in life that are certain. You know, we're going to die. <laughs> the cliche taxes is pretty certain, although I'm really interested with cryptocurrency and, you know, other, other decentralized uh, methods, how that will remain a certainty. But there's the things that are on the horizon that we read about, we think are going to be huge, whether it's, you know, cryptocurrency or blockchain or AI, self-driving cars. And a lot of these are interrelated, of course. You know, longevity science, CRISPR and gene editing, you know, this kind of thing, space. But which of these is going to change the world most dramatically from your mm. perspective and how? And maybe the place to start, maybe, and I'll let you answer however you want, but the one I'm, yeah. I had at the top of my list is AI, because I think sure. it was something in your writing that it was one of your allies had suggested it will transform life in the world like electricity has. Yes. For like, what, how, like, how is that possible? What would that look like? So I think it's a really interesting question to think about um, what are the longer term implications of technology generally? And I think the, the mistake we're making is that we're looking at technology, very often we're looking at technology in isolation. So you look at a technology, let's say, I don't know, like cryptocurrency and say, okay, what can this do for? And then you, you take the, the narrow defined use case, the one which is obvious, right? So you say cryptocurrency, what does cryptocurrency do for uh, investing or currencies, you know, fiat currencies proper, like money, cash currencies and so on. And there's, there surely will be a massive effect on this. But the really interesting question becomes for me is what happens when these technologies start to merge? I give you a really interesting, weird example. Um, and this is not even that far out. So you take something like um, uh, computer edit design. So we have that forever, right? So we, we, we create objects. Like if you create a machine, uh, you don't draw it on a piece of paper. You draw it on a computer and the computer already helps you design this machine. Now, the next step from that is to say, okay, so if, if we have a model, a 3D model of a machine, for example, already in a computer, can we simulate the machine? So can we basically run the machine through a simulation? Um, and this is something uh, a company called uh, GE, for example, tries to do or does um, with something they call a digital twin. So you create, let's say you, you design a, an elevator, you create a digital copy of that elevator and run it through a simulation. Now, in the simulation, you can now test and run and figure out when will certain parts break, right? So the whole idea about the digital twin is that they will show up at your, if you run this elevator, they will come to your elevator and say, we know from our simulation that in about a week, the following part will break. So let us swap this now so you don't have downtime. Uh, and in the industrial world, that downtime is one of the big challenges. So now here's the interesting thing. This is where most people stop thinking. But now you add and layer into this AI, artificial intelligence, and you say, well, if I can run a simulation, I can run a simulation of a modified copy of that product. So let's say I take my elevator and I make it like a tiny little tweak. And then I run both copies in a simulation and have them compete against each other. And then we see which one survives, like pure Darwinism, like just what nature does, right? 
And then you create another copy and let that compete with the copy which just survived and so on and so on and so on. And what you'll come to is the machine will run within relatively short period of time, millions and millions of these simulations will have designed an elevator which will probably look like nothing a human would have ever designed, but will perform better than anything a human could ever even think about. And we're seeing this today. There's something called, uh, the technology is called generative design. Uh, this company here in San Francisco called Autodesk, which is doing this, um, they're using this to design, for example, the frame of a drone, you know, like the X structure, which holds the propellers and so on, where they give the parameters into an AI, let the AI figure that out. And then the AI creates a, a, a 3D printed structure for this um, uh, kind of like frame for the drone, which again, looks like nothing a human would have ever been able to produce. So that's an interesting, just an interesting thought, what happens when you let these things like actually converge. Now think about what, what this means if you take something like gene editing and you run this through massive computers or you run it through quantum computers, which will be uh, even better at doing simulations, right? So uh, for example, drug discovery, uh, which is pretty much still a very manual process today, uh, will become massively sped up, where we run hundreds of thousands of combinations in an hour and you know get the results back. And that will change very dramatically, not just life, but like even the approach we have to doing things, to like designing them or making them better and so on. Right? So just a few examples of like how you know like convergence of technology really shifts the the equation. And that's the reason why you know, we keep saying tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. And it's important to understand like tomorrow is not tomorrow in 30 years, 40 years, you know, like far out. Tomorrow is kind of tomorrow, you know, like tomorrow as in 24 hours later. Yeah. No, like I've, I've read these things that talk about how AI, especially when we reach the level of general AI, that it will obsolete basically entire professions and things that we go to school for years for or are very specialized or technical, even things like, you know, medical diagnoses or legal work, you know, complex mm-hmm. contracts and negotiations and like all these kinds of things that a machine will be able to do that better than any human, you know, faster, cheaper, m- with a higher quality. And I think, you know, what, like, is that, is that really going to happen? How far out is it? And what does the world look like? I mean, are we all then playing board games and creating artistic expressions and exploring philosophy, you know, or we're focused on off-world travel? Like, I mean, what – are we headed to a utopia if that happens or or, or what, you know? what What's your best understanding today? Um so I think there's there's a man this is a this is a big onion which has a lot of layers so let's unpeel a few of them. Um, so I think the first misunderstanding people have is they talk about like unfortunately we talk about the future of work and the future of jobs. And I think you actually make this make the right point here. It's more the future of professions. So say for example you take the legal profession in the legal profession, there's certain jobs, um, which a paralegal, for example, does, where they go into a data room and they go through thousands of contracts to find the five contracts which have this weird formulation which needs to be fixed, right? An AI and a machine learning algorithm uh, can do this way better than any human, right? They don't get tired. They don't complain. They, they can read every word, whereas the human probably skips a bunch and so on and so on. So that job will probably go away. Like, does a job of someone sitting in, like, in a dark room, like, going through thousands and thousands and thousands of papers go away? Yes, I think so. Is that dramatic? Well, quite frankly, no, because in a lot of ways, that is not a job a human should do in the first place, right? It's not a particularly good job and nice job to be, to be done. Um, I would also argue that we had these shifts throughout history. I mean, before we had the power drill, the way you got like a hole into like a, a you know like into a wall was like you did this manually. So it took me, it took you like ten times as much. Did anyone complain about the power drill? Yeah, probably. Like I don't know. Probably someone complained and said like, well, it's taking my job away because I'm like not drilling anymore, right? But you know, it makes life better. So I, I think that's the first part. The second part is, and this goes to the utopia question. Um, There is this notion of like, oh yeah, my God, like then we all will become philosophers or play music, and you know what kind of world will that be quite frankly when i look at 
what are the big problems in the world today? And you just look at something like the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations, of which there are like, what, 17 or something? Um, we have our work cut out for us. There is a lot of work for us to do. Like, let's fix all of this. Like, let's make all of these problems go away. You know, like every child is educated. You know, nobody's dying of hunger anymore. Like, we've all clean drinking water. Once we have that done, let's have a conversation if we are now like laying back and, you know, like enjoying the fruit of our labor a little bit. But until then, I think we've got a lot of problems to solve and a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, that, that's a really valid perspective. And of course, the, the hope and the promise is that this technology will assist us, right, in resolving those issues. I mean, I was just having this conversation with someone today that if the statistic is true, and I have no reason to believe it isn't, that between 30 and 40% of food in the United States goes to waste. Mm -hmm. And yet one in six children goes to bed hungry every night. I know. You know, that clearly we have the technology to distribute, you know, food to those kids, but the other socio and economic factors, including the empathy, the awareness, the willingness, I mean, and those are maybe beyond the domain of technology in a, in a strict sense, but there's a lot... There's a lot of work to be done in a lot of dimensions. There's, there's no question. So, yeah, exactly. All right. Maybe we could check in at least like once a year and just see how we do it. How many of those SDGs have we checked off? <laughs> hey, we should. We should. Yeah. And we should, we should hold, hold ourselves accountable to that for yeah. sure. No, that's, that's, that's beautiful. And then on the inverse, the question, you know, obviously there's a lot, there's a lot that's changing now, an exciting time to be alive. From your view, and this is a broad question too, but what won't change about the world, about human beings? What do you see is as sure as anything, a sure bet when it comes to us, when it comes to the world, that's going to be the, true in the future? Hmm. So you mentioned this actually in the beginning. I think for, uh, for the foreseeable future, we will still die, um, as sad as that sounds. Um, so that will not go away. Um, I believe, generally speaking, our basic human needs, um, and particularly the needs we have, which are, you know, if you think about Maslow's uh, 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 the pyramid of the, the hierarchies, right? Um, if you think about those, um, particularly the higher evolved needs, um, you know, stuff like belonging, human connection, etc., that will not go away. Um, we will probably um, substitute a few of those f from, you know, one modality to another. Um, so think about, could you service some of those needs um, through uh, either a virtual reality experience um, or through a, a machine, right, like a robot, for example. Um, and there's a couple of these science fiction movies which talk about like how, for example, robots in elderly care can start replacing certain elements of this human interaction. So we'll see if that happens. But I think that the, the need, the core need itself for the human doesn't go away. Right? The human still wants to have comfort and um, outside of the basic needs like food, shelter, and so on. But like once you have comfort, once you have connection, once you have be around other human social beings, right? I mean, the reason why I find this always so funny when people talk about like how, you know, like the young generation, like whatever you want to call them, the millennials, Gen Z, whatsoever, how they're not like social anymore, right? Because they're now always on their phones at the same time as like, well, they are super social. They're actually way more social than you were, you know, like than I was when I was like their age. Uh, it's just a different modality. Now you can bemoan the fact that that modality is probably less human, Right, because there's less human interact, like direct human interaction, um, but it still, it still fulfills the need of a person to be socially active, to be connected to other human beings, to you know whatever it is. Yeah, to love. No. That makes that makes a lot of sense to me. And for anybody that worries about the next generation, I when that comes up in discussion, I always think of that saying, you know what's going to happen to the to the next generation. They're going to grow up yeah, to course. worry about the next generation. <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> you know it's always that. That is the that is the never ending uh, the never ending uh, schema for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, a couple things while we're in this area of the discussion that I that I just want to explore with you. One is this idea I heard you mention somewhere: um, heart math. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I'm heart math certified trainer. Actually, I'm a big believer in, in, uh, the value of that process, which I think is pretty amazing because from my view, they've simply taken thousands like ancient wisdom <laughs> and put it in a very scientific and rational package. And now they're redistributing it, which I think is great. But why, if, if I'm understanding you, why does heart math matter? in this world with all this technology and innovation and advancement? I think the short version of that is to say that most of the stuff we're seeing being quote-unquote invented today um, is actually um, a recombination of existing stuff to make something new which fulfills a need in a slightly better way. Right. So if you think about... Um, and nothing against this, but if you think about like something like Instagram, Instagram really didn't do anything new, right? Like in a way, it's like all they did is they like took a picture, they added, you know, like these filters which make the pictures look a little bit better, and they made it super easy for you to share it, and there's a cool brand behind it. There's nothing interesting actually in Instagram per se. Um, I believe that to a certain extent we have lost the ability or the willingness, probably even more so to really tackle problems from a first principle, like hard math potential, where you go like all the way down to the base, the root cause and build up from there. And that's, that's harder, way harder. It's more expensive. It's, you know, it takes way more time. Uh, It's not as glorious. Uh, But in the, in the world of um, Silicon Valley, at least, um, there's this really interesting story around in Silicon Valley, we had in the late 60s, uh, we had a place called Xerox Park. And Xerox Park did ultimately hard math, right? They invented a lot. And uh, in a, a relatively short period of time, about just 10 years, they invented effectively 50% of what became the internet. They invented uh, the laser printer. They invented the, um, the graphical user interface, a bunch of other stuff. There is an argument to be made that what Silicon Valley did over the last 50 years, effectively, 40 years since Xerox Park is gone, is to commercialize the stuff which came out of Xerox Park. And the people from Xerox Park, particularly Alan Kay, go on the record and say, well, Silicon Valley, you need to do something new now because you're running out of stuff you com- can commercialize from the stuff we invented 40 years ago. And I think that's sad. And I think there's truth to it, right? So now if you think about like the really interesting problems in this world, they will not be solved by a recombination of existing factors that require someone to do like real research, you know, like go really deep into the physics, the biology, the chemistry, the math around problems. And that's how you solve problems. So um, I think there's a, there's a dire need in this world for people to go back to like really look at problems from a first principle perspective and try to figure out, like, how do you actually solve this without just taking the shortcut of, like, you know, just take stuff off the shelf and recombine it and throw that against the problem. That works, but it doesn't get you to solutions in many areas anymore. And this concept of first principles thinking, it's powerful. I know it's been talked about for a while in Silicon Valley. I think it's making its way more broadly into the kind of thought sphere of the you know yeah. the conversational domain of the business world, but will you just share a little bit about it? What's your view, your understanding of what first principles thinking is and how we can do it? Yeah, sure. So, and by the way, Silicon Valley didn't invest invent this, right? First principles comes out of of physics, where you basically say, okay, so we've got this problem. Now let's break it down to like the the next level down, and then the next level down until you get to the base of it. And the base of it is literally what is the physical principle something is made of um, or the chemical principles or the biology uh, principles. Um, There's a really beautiful story uh, Elon Musk um, tells about first principles because he's he's a huge proponent of this idea. And I think some of the, the brilliance of Elon is his ability to do so, like to think in first principles and push other people to do so. Um, so the example he gives is um, when they thought about building the mega factory, which is this big factory they built to create um, batteries, the starting point for them was to say, we saw that a kilowatt hour battery, so if you buy a battery which has a kilowatt hour power, um, is about $80 on the market. And he said, 
what we did is we basically said, what is this battery even made of in terms of what are the chemicals being used? What is the, you know, like the canister being made of and so on. So you break this down to first principles to literally say like, here's the, 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 the bill of material which makes a battery. And what Elon found is that the bill of material on the spot market, if you were to buy it, costs you about $8 a kilowatt hour. So somehow between $8 of bill of materials, it goes all the way up to $80 until it's basically in your car in his case, right? And he said, like, that's stupid. Like, that can't be. Like, that seems wasteful. So by having the ability to look at the first principles, you see the broken, pr the broken process and can now build it from the ground up. Now you can say, okay, so... What does it take, us, take for us to create a battery? How can we do this? How can we do this effectively? And so on. And then you end up with building the mega factory. Now, what most people do is they look at an $80 battery and they say, huh, okay, can we make this a little bit cheaper? And then you create a battery for like $75. And you pat yourself on the back and rightfully so because you just save, shaved off $5. What Elon does is he goes from the bottom up and he creates a battery for whatever, like $30. Right? And just basically destroyed the battery market. Uh, so that's the, that's the interesting piece when you like really force yourself to go down to first principles and figure out like what is it made of and then recombine the pieces and go up again. Very often you get to insights you couldn't see otherwise. Yeah, that, that's powerful. And, you know, I remember seeing this when I early in my career in management where I would see that the common practice when preparing for the next year was to just look at your existing expenses. You know, what was our budget this year? And then let's just increase sales by some small factor or aim to decrease expenses by some factor instead of going back to a white sheet and just saying, what are our outcomes and how could we get there as efficiently as possible instead of being burdened by the past, you Absolutely. know, so I think there's something really potentially very powerful there. So speaking of, of business and management, I want to go back to a discussion of your book, um, the future, the future of work mm -hmm. is what we're calling it now. Future um, of business. The future of business. Thank you. Thank yes. you. The future of business. See how titles change? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Now yeah. I need to write about the future of work. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, somebody's just going to walk into Barnes & Noble. I actually used to be a bookseller at Barnes & Noble as well. So I've had this experience. People will call up or they'll walk in. I'm looking for a book. Okay. <laughs> it's blue. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It's got a guy on the front, you know? So anyway, um, so let me, okay, let me go back to this book, The Future of Business. Mm -hmm. So- how do you want the world to be different as a result of you having written and published this book? What we use the book for is to make the world aware of a change we're seeing in like a very fundamental change in the way businesses are being run. And the hope is that, uh, and the aim we're having with the book is that we aim you with not just an understanding. First of all, we aim, we aim to give you a really like a first principles understanding of what happens in the world. And then we provide you with some insight and frameworks and models which allow you to create a company or modify your existing company in a way that it is going to be successful in the future. And the reason why we're doing this is, and the reason what really drives me is, if you think about the glue which keeps society together, for better or worse, it's business, right? Like people get a lot of their identity around from their work. They get their livelihood from their work. Um, they spend most of their lives at work. Now you can bemoan this and you can say societally that's bad and we should find a different model. But as long as that is true, I think we need to make sure that work still exists and that these companies still exist and that they're thriving and that people have good, meaningful work inside of those companies, which they can identify with, etc. So that's the reason why we go and say, well, we see this big shift happening. You need to be aware of it. You can leverage it and actually have success with it and make, you know, like create wealth and hopefully wealth for everyone and involved in this, in this endeavor. Um, but you need to do it because otherwise you're screwed. So what's, what's the shift and do you the have biggest, a, a clever yeah. name for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we call this hourglass economics and the, um, the shift is so for everyone who's like even semi-schooled in economics, they will get it immediately. So for about four decades, 
Um, we're talking about most markets, particularly consumer markets. We talk about most markets as um, uh, what we call product pyramids. So a product pyramid is in most markets you have um, at the very top of the pyramid, um, and you know the pyramid is like this triangle shape. At the very top of that triangle, you have high margin, low volume products. And at the bottom, you've got the exact opposite, right? So let's say fashion, for example. You've got at the top of fashion, you've got I don't know, let's say Gucci and Prada at the very top, right? High margin, low volume, highly successful companies, but they sell, you know, like to a very specific niche market. And then at the very bottom of it, you have, um, you know, fashion brands like H&M, Zara, Primark. Um, So they sell massive volume, very low margin. They're kind of everywhere. And then you've got this whole thing in the middle. Uh, in the middle is like your Gap and your Abercrombie and Fitch and, you know, you name them. So all the stuff you see in a mall. And the big shift we're seeing, and we're seeing this in market after market after market, is that this pyramid shape shifts into what will look like an hourglass. What this means is that the markets are tearing apart. That means the bottom gets bigger and bigger and fatter and fatter. Um, so this is your convenience product. You don't care all that much about the brand or you care about the brand, but it's more like a... Um, a safety brand, more like a brand where you say, I know that Primark has good quality, that's fine, right? And then at the top, because we see a lot of these shifts in the way businesses are being run and you can run them today because of the internet, because of exponentially accelerating technology, AI, blah, 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 3D printing, you can create ever more companies which are ever smaller in niches and service those niches profitably, um, so you and I share a, uh, a passion for two of those companies in the fashion space. One is a company called Noble. Um, they do shoes. Um, they basically just create one pair of shoes and they make this one pair and you're going to show me your shoes. Oh my God, I love those. They're my favorite ones. So these shoes, they make one pair of shoes and that's it. You know, and they've got a brilliant business model behind it and they sell into a very specific niche. And the other one is, is an underwear company called Me Undies. And Me Undies does make, they make, you know, basically one pair of underwear, you know, like different colors, different sizes, and so on. But that's it. They're not selling you sweatshirts and trousers and, you know, all this other stuff. So again, we're seeing this massive shift to this hourglass. We really call this hourglass economics because there's a whole like economic model behind this. And my fear is, and this is the reason why we're feeling so compelled to write this book and why we, f- we feel it needs to be out there in the world, is most companies, if you think about it, most companies operate in the middle. Most companies are the stuff which will go away. And so we see this middle disappearing, this hourglass shifting. It's huge opportunities, by the way. So you can become, you can, if you manage to go down market and, and go into the bottom of the hourglass, you become literally an infrastructural type of company. If you can't go up down there you need to go up and if you go up you can create these highly profitable um, beautiful um, positioned little brands like noble and meandies in the fashion industry yeah and even nike like i'm so amazed at these large corporations who are customizing you know and individualizing apparel you know Mm -hmm. a very high quality very personalized and you know brands like ferrari have been doing it forever getting the stitching on your seats and you know but that's obviously not a mass market thing but to see that coming closer to you know the the average american or average global citizen which the average is rising and i i understand there's still so many people who are living in extreme poverty but it is amazing as you're saying these these ends of a you know an hourglass I, I see that in in my own in, in my own experience as a as a consumer, absolutely. So what do so now that businesses understand this as a concept, right? Because often you know a model itself can be useful to create mm-hmm. a new understanding, open up a new possibility. Let's just I, I imagine you probably have examples of companies who either have done this successfully or or could do this successfully. Who do you point to? Like, who's doing this well? Or who could do this well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you see a lot of companies now bumping up in the, in the consumer space. And, and if you are a, an internet consumer, so if you buy a lot of your stuff on the internet or you're kind of plugged into the internet ecosystem, so to say, you see a lot of these companies, particularly at the top of the hourglass. Um, 
So uh, we talked about fashion where we see this. Um, you see it um, online mattress sales. There's a company called Casper, uh, which a lot of people know by now, of course. Um, again, like really fascinating. So Casper grows like wildfire. They sell you one product more or less. This is just like one mattress, right? Now they've got three models, but that's about it. Um, whereas at the same time, the big mattress superstores, which sell you like 200 different types of mattresses and they're kind of undifferentiated, they're dying. You know, so we see it there. Um, uh, there's a, tooth, uh, a toothpaste company in the U.S. called Hello, Hello Toothpaste. Same deal. It's like they make toothpaste. They compete with Colgate and, you know, Procter & Gamble and doing really well. So we see that. And then on the bottom, you see, you know, like ultimately the uh, Amazonification of everything, right? So Amazon has become this like massive juggernaut, which is like eating up more and more and more. And you see it in China. When you look at Chinese companies, the big Chinese companies, you see it in fashion with Primark, um, where it's probably interesting. So again, like we see it in the consumer space and then people point out like, well, it's only consumer. And I'm like, that's not true. Like you look at a, at an, at an industry like uh, automobiles, cars, like we're seeing it in cars where at the bottom of the, the pyramid, you've got these, you've got ultimately, at least currently, these massive car companies like Volkswagen and Toyota, which supply most of the cars being made in the world uh, at, at, in terms of volume. You've got at the top of it, you've got, of course, like already your differentiated brands like Porsche. Um, but you see now for the first time in the history of cars because of the fact that it is, has become so cheap and easy to build an electric vehicle. You now, when you go to a car show, you see these car manufacturers popping up, which you have never heard of before. Yeah. Right? It's like there's suddenly a car manufacturer and they make one model. And you're like, what the hell? The other day I read... Um, uh, Usain Bolt, the guy who is the world champion, the world record holder in the 100-meter dash, he started a car company. He's got an electric car, which he will want or he wants to sell for th uh, uh, less than $10,000, $9,999. It's a tiny little electric car, right? I mean, like Usain Bolt. Is it disposable? I mean, like, what is that? That's yeah, crazy, that. right? Yeah. But wow. then you have in the middle, again, like stuck these companies like in the US, you've got like companies like GM, you yeah. know, yeah, with all their brands. And you're like, you're not differentiated. You're not like a mass market, you know, like bottom of it. You're not differentiated to the top. And now think about what the economic implications of this are. There's like hundreds of thousands of people work at these companies. Right. So that's what keeps me up at night. And I'm like, I look at this and I'm like, wow, like this has massive economic implications and we need to figure that out. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, and with with business too, um, one thing that I've been really struck by is this conversation about culture, something mm -hmm. you speak a lot about as well. And you talk about how important a purpose is for an organization. There oh, were yeah. two things in particular I wanted to ask you about here. One of them was something that you wrote about Kevin Starr with the Mulago Foundation. Yep. Talking about articulating a mission in eight words or less. Mm -hmm. And using this verb target outcome model. Mm -hmm. Will you just share a little bit about why, like what that is, why it could be useful to somebody? Yeah, of course. Uh, so let's start out with like very briefly introducing Kevin. So Kevin is a dear friend of mine. Um, he f is um, a partner of co-founder of the Mulago Foundation. Um, Mulago has been doing um, uh, impact investing pretty much longer than anyone else in the world. Um, they've been on this for like 30 years um, uh, Kevin is an absolutely incredible human being. And uh, Kevin, a while ago, quite a while ago, actually developed this model where he said, we work with all these, in his case, non -profit, typically non-profits, some for-profits, um, but we work with these organizations. Um, they're doing this really Im important work, but they can't really formulate what the heck they're actually doing. And then the challenge is once you can't formulate it, you don't know what to measure and you don't know how to measure it. And you also have this, this constant struggle with what is in and what is outside of scope. You know, like there's an opportunity pops up and you're like, wow, we should do this. But it is really furthering the thing you actually want to do. Questionable. Right? So he developed this framework, which um, I first learned about at Unreasonable, um, which is another incredible in institution in the uh, global impact space. 
Um, later, he brought this to Google.org, where I used to work, um, where we used this as an internal framework. Um, and then uh, I adopted it very broadly for basically all the work we're doing. So simple, it's a very simple framework. The idea is the following. Um, there is a difference between purpose and mission. Purpose is your, if you think about Simon Sinek's Start With Why, this framework, purpose is your why. Why the hell do you even exist? Right? And purpose is this, like, this is like something you need to very personally answer. The company needs to, needs to really personally figure that out. And the encouragement, the idea we, we toss around at Singularity University is, um, and is popularized by a, a colleague of mine, Salim Ismail, is this notion of the massive transformative purpose. So the purpose of a company is not to make money. The purpose of a company is not to make shareholders richer. Right? The purpose of a company is typically should be and really should be about something which is beyond the company itself. Right? So the societal impact, the, the thing which the company can bring to the world. Um, and when you have purpose, so as a first step, when you have purpose, what happens is that people can actually align with you and can fall in line with you and they can say, I believe in your purpose. I'm with you. I'm part, I want to be part of that journey. It's a really powerful tool. So purpose is, is, the, is the initial part. And then Kevin said, okay, so purpose, you know, in the impact space, everybody has purpose, of course. Otherwise, you wouldn't do the work, right? But then he said, the challenge is then translating purpose into something which is concrete. And that's your mission. And his whole idea around mission statement is to say, write your mission statement in the following form. Verb, what are you doing? Target, whom you're doing it for? Outcome, what is the outcome you want to achieve? And his encouragement is to do this literally in eight words or less. The benefit you get from there is you have a very concise, very easy to remember, like it, it can become a mantra, right? Like you can literally like use it as a mantra. You get a very concise way to express what you're doing. It gives you a very clear view of, you know, who's your target, what do you actually want to achieve, and then you can measure against it. Now, make no mistake, that might not be the thing you write on your website. It might be, but, you know, like you might want to have on your website a little bit more the flourish version, you know, like wordsmithing, etc. Um, but I think it's very important for a company to have this as their purpose statement internally, I give you an example out of my own world, which is um, Singularity University. Now, granted, they can't break this down to eight words. Uh, it's much wordier. But the purpose statement, uh, the mission statement, sorry, the mission statement is incredible because Singularity's mission statement is we inspire, educate, and empower. So this is your verbs, right? Inspire, educate, empower. Leaders, this is your target. And now the outcome to apply exponentially accelerating technologies to tackle the world's greatest challenges, right? So it's super clear what we're doing. It's like we're in the business of inspiring, educating, empowering leaders. So we work with the leaders in the organization or leaders in like individual leaders. Two, and then the aim is have them understand how these technologies work and leverage those new technologies to tackle the world's biggest problems. Now, you could make this shorter and more concise, for sure. And there is some, some debate we have internally around, you know, what does inspire, educate, and empower actually mean? Are they all equally important, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so it's better to have a singular verb. Um, but it is extremely powerful. Um, I'll give you one more example. This is, um, there's an organization called the One Acre Fund. Uh, One Acre Fund works with um, subsistence farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, um, so these are farmers who live um, and, and have less than one acre of land which they uh, use for agriculture. And the challenge for them is that very often, um, because they don't have the right tools, they don't have the right knowledge, um, they can't even produce enough food on this little farm to feed themselves, let alone sell something. So one acre, farm, one acre fund goes out, gives them loans to allow them to buy better materials, buy better seeds, you know, that kind of stuff, so that they actually get to... Um, subsistence, subsistence, and or even make re revenue, actual revenue on it. And their whole like mission statement is get African, f get African farmers out of extreme poverty. It becomes super clear, right? It's like you wake up and you're like, okay, great, I know what I'm, I'm supposed to do. I need to get African farmers out of extreme poverty, and it, it leaves enough room for them to be creative. And at the same time, it allows them also to say, if someone comes and says, hey, let's export your model to Asia. 
you say, well, unless we change our strategy, it's not happening because that's not what we stand for. Yeah. Right? So it's, I think it's super powerful. Yeah, it, it is powerful. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about something I've heard a lot in the world of, you know, family dynamics, family enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not unique to this, but is that the process is often as valuable as the product. Meaning mm -hmm. sometimes just engaging in these discussions with your team about who do we serve? You know, what are we trying to do? You know, what is, what are the specific, like you're saying, is it educate? Is it inspire? You know, is it empower? What, which, what do those even mean? And which one would we choose or something else? And that all of that debate, that dialogue, that discussion can be very, very um, valuable in and of itself. Yep. Absolutely. Something I heard you talk about on a podcast you you did that I thought was a really, really cool way of describing, you know, like how to actually go about creating a culture. Because as we know, you know, if you don't create it intentionally, you're still going to have one. It's mm -hmm. going to show up from the attitudes, the beliefs, the behaviors of people in your, in your team, in your environment. Um, but you talked about storytelling, rituals, and artifacts as mm -hmm. very concrete ways of actually shaping your culture. Would you be willing to say a few words about what those are and, and why they're so important and how we can use them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, like as you described, and you're spot on with this, like culture happens no matter what, right? Like you have a culture, like everybody mm -hmm. has a culture in their organization, uh, if they like it or not. Um, and culture really is a manifestation of everything that is being said, everything that is being done, and everything you see, right? So you get to rituals, artifacts, um, and the, uh, uh, the, the idea around storytelling, so you take that and then you take just our understanding or the general understanding of human nature and the way we, we grew up as, as a species and how we learn and how we connect with other, uh, other members of our species. And that happens through storytelling and rituals, right? It happens to like this, like, you know, really literally back in the day, we sat around the campfire and we told stories and that's how we learned. So there's incredible power in using story as a, as a mechanism to, um, to bestow culture, right? So if you tell a story about how an employee, uh, here's a good example. Uh, so you might know Zappos, the company which is a shoe company, right? Sells shoes. Zappos famously has this like super strong customer centricity in, this, in their um, customer service culture. So they basically make it right for the customer no matter what. One of the stories you hear over and over and over again, and think about if that is intentionally or if that just happened, is that uh, Zappos famously, someone called Zappos customer support and wanted to test them out and said, I want to order a pizza. And the person at, at Zappos said, like, sure, you know, where do you live? Let me order one for you, right? And they ordered that person a pizza, right? Now, that sounds super silly, and it, it, of course, it has nothing to do with Zappos' business, but it demonstrates a point, which is Zappos employees go above and beyond the call of duty, right? Like every other company would have said like, you know, WTF and would have hung up, right? So uh, that is a story which Zappos starts to perpetuate, right? It's like a story they start telling over and over and over again. Not just because it's a cute story, but it teaches you something. It teaches you something of how Zappos looks at their customers, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's one. Well, and, then, and even on that topic, by the way, I, yeah. I mean, I, I've heard, of course, we all hear, you know, if you're paying attention to anything related to business these days, we're hearing a lot about culture. We're hearing a lot about storytelling. But it wasn't until I heard you talk about this that I really got for the first time that our society is built on culture. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, on stories. It's a story, of right? course. It's not just yeah. an organization. It's not just any given company. But also this whole, you know, religions and, and, and all this. And so this idea of actually very deliberately looking for those or creating those, retelling those as a leader, you know, how powerful that could be in teaching something and establishing expectations, what's permissible here, what gets rewarded or not, you know, it's very, yeah. very powerful. Yeah, exactly. And, and one thing which is important to understand is like, you know, like the, 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 the dark brother of storytelling is gossip, mm. right? And so storytelling happens again no matter what, 
Like you can storytell and you can create a, comp- a culture of s- a storytelling, you know, or if like in the vacuum of that, people will start doing storytelling themselves, which might like more turn into gossip, right? Which is the, oh, did you see John? Like he, you know, like he again did this and this, right? Again, which is a storytelling, me- it's a storytelling device, right? So better fill that, fill that void with positive stories, which actually... Um, embody the culture you want to create and the values you care about and you want to see in your company. So I think that's one. Then the second one is, is around rituals. And rituals is really this idea of kind of manifesting stories and storytelling in a little bit more of a, of a habit-forming device. You know, so rituals can be anything. I mean, you, like we all know these like rituals of like or heard of them in like sales teams where you make the sale and someone goes up and like rings the bell, you know, that's a ritual. I mean, there's, there's some power behind this and it sounds stupid. And like, you look at this and you're like, guys, we are like adults and why do we do this? And at the same time, there's some real power in it. Right. And if you, if you create the story then around this, right, if the, if the ringing the bell has an actual meaning, right, it becomes a whole, uh, a whole different game and it becomes really, really powerful. And then the last part is artifacts, which is really, it's storytelling uh, expressed in physical form. That's the easiest way you can think about it, right? So artifacts is like everything around you, like all the stuff you have around you. So an artifact for me is a beautiful way to think about an artifact is, um, and I do this as a, as a hobby, like I go into the lobby of a company, any company, and just look at the lobby. And I can tell you the lobby, the way the lobby looks tells you a lot about the company, right? So what are the pictures on the wall? Did they put any effort into it? Like, did they care about this? What is the interaction um, uh, you have in, in terms of the, um, uh, as, a, as a guest, right? You know, like, how do you get greeted? Like, what is, like, what is the inten- intentionality behind that? Um, like, what are the physical objects in the room? Like, how does this all look like? And it doesn't mean, like, people sometimes misjudge this as, oh, I need to, it needs to be fancy. You know, like, they say, oh, it needs to be, like, posh and you know whatever like designed and stuff that's not the point it's about intentionality right like if you put a like if you put a chair in your reception area someone will notice it so you know like there is intention intentionality even if you didn't have any intentionality by just putting a chair in there and you're like ah just put this old chair in there like we don't need it anymore right yeah it 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 creates intentionality for someone else yeah. So this is really powerful and it shifts, it shifts, it shapes and shifts culture ultimately. I know that that's true. And I'm going to go walk up through our lobby again and pay <laughs> particular yeah, right? attention. But it reminds me of that saying, you know, in the personal growth industry, primarily about how you do anything is how you do everything. And I yep. think that's true for an organization as it is for an individual. I think that's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I just last week I was in uh New York doing a podcast. I interviewed Scott Harrison with Charity Water. Mm -hmm. And I went in and I went in to use the restroom before the interview. And the restroom had this music playing. (laughs) It was like, it was really chill. You know, it was, and I couldn't hear it from the lobby, but there it was in the restroom. And I was like, that was unexpected. But, you know, the whole office was so thoughtful, you know, and everyone, every person in it was so helpful. It was, it was really interesting. So I've recently experienced exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Okay, so now I want to transition our conversation to the enlightening lightning round. So, question number one. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. (laughs) Life is like a... Series of random events. Mm. Number two. What's something at which you wish you were better? Pretty much anything and everything. I love to learn. (laughs) Yes, me too. Number three, if you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? No logo. Number four, what book other than your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Stephen Pressfield's Do the Work. Why that book? I just love it. So first of all, Stephen is an incredible writer. Um, Do the Work is the shortened version of an excellent book uh, he wrote called The uh, War of Art. 
um, which is really about the, the creative process and the writing process. And do the work is a little bit more abstract. It's a little bit more like about life. It's a 90-minute read. It's a, like a little nugget you can read. It has one of the, my favorite quotes of all times uh, in there, which is, On the field of the self stand a knight and a dragon. Resistance is the dragon. You are the knight. Mm. Yeah, and the, here's the power of the book. So I gave this book to a, a VP engineering at a larger tech company. Um, that company happens to be on the East Coast. Uh, he was visiting me on the West Coast. Uh, he read the book on the... So we had a lot of conversations around, like, you know, future of his job and whatever. And um, he read the book on the plane, called me when he stepped off the plane. It's a true story. And said, Pascal, I just... Uh, on the flight, I read the book. I finished the book. I wrote my resignation letter. I just sent it. Wow. That's the power of the book. Holy cow. It's good. It's really good. Yeah. No, I love, I love, I too love Pressfield. I love War of Art and all the discussion of resistance. And uh, I just found his book, Turning Pro. Mm -hmm. And that inspired me about just yep. taking your art, your craft to another level of discipline. Really, yep. really beautiful. What are you reading right now? Um, I'm reading a lot of books uh, which are related to my book, the book I'm currently writing. So um, a lot of books, not, they're great. They wouldn't be what I would normally read. Um, but it's a lot of kind of like back end uh, research. Uh, one book I, I, I just recently read, um, or I'm actually in the process of reading, is um, Corey Rutherfeld. Jesus, I get this wrong. You have to look this up in the, uh, in the script notes. Um, he is the co-founder of Ogilvy. Um, and he uh, wrote a book about things that don't make sense, do things that don't make sense. Um, it's amazing. It is so fun to read. Uh, it's really like the uh, the notion in the that in the advertising industry is taking it out of the advertising industry, basically saying like you need to do these things which are counterintuitive, um, because more often than not they actually work. And then he applies it to life. I just love the book. It's so funny. Um, yeah, it's great. I saw that book on uh, on you, in one of your newsletters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's also a beautiful book. It's like when you buy the hardcover, someone gifted it to me. The, the hardcover is like this golden book with like this like embossed imprint. It's a really beautiful book. It's really fun to read. Yeah, now it's called Alchemy, the Dark Art Alchemy. and Science of Creating Magic in Brands, Business, and Life by Rory Sutherland. Rory Sutherland, that's it. Alchemy yeah. it is. Yeah, that's that, correct. That looks, like a, that looks like a fun book. It's super fun. I highly recommend it. That's great. Okay, next question. So you travel a ton. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Um, two things. So um, I recently splurged and bought a set of Bose sleep buds. Um, so these are little Bose headphones. They're tiny. Um, you put them in your ear. They seal your ear, similar to like a like a you know, like one of these things they give you on an airline to like block your ear uh, from the sound, uh, seal your ear, but they also play um, kind of white noise and you can choose which kind of white noise you want to have. So like, you know, thunderstorms or a river, river, flowing river or something. Um, I sleep like a baby with these things. They're absolutely amazing, particularly uh, when I'm in a hotel um, and I want to block out kind of like street noise or so. Uh, plus, if you have used them a couple of times, Somehow your brain gets conditioned that every time you hear this particular white noise, in my case, I love the sound of uh, rain. Um, when I hear the sound of rain, I just get tired. Mm. Um, so that works beautifully. Um, that's travel hack number 1A. And there's a number 1B, which is uh, associated with that, which is um, melatonin um, to make you like sleepy and drowsy. Um, a good friend and a colleague of mine at Singularity University, uh, Michael Gillum, um, who's dual board certified, um, a physician uh, gave me that tip. He said, use, if you want to take melatonin, um, take a five milligram time release dose. Um, so it, it disintegrates in your, in your system slower over time. And take that together with a three milligram just normal dose, which you put underneath your tongue. So you swallow the five milligrams, you put the three milligram under your tongue, it gets into your bloodstream relatively quickly. So it knocks me, typically it knocks me out within 30 minutes. 
then I'm sleeping. And because I've got the five milligrams slowly disintegrating in my system, it keeps me sleeping. Um, so that keeps me sleeping for uh, typically a good seven to eight hours, which is gold if you travel particularly across time zones. And then the last hack is, uh, mentioned this, I, and I didn't really do this on purpose, but I started doing this a little while ago and it really helps me, which is um, I stopped doing the math on time zones at all. Hmm. So you know like how you get into a time zone and like my parents do this all the time. They're really cute. They're like, oh, we're in the US and you know, like they live in Europe and they're like, oh, now it would be, you know, like 2 a.m., Right. Or now we should be tired because it's getting 10, you know, and somehow I think you you're by reinforcing that notion, you're kind of like keeping your your brain in that mode. Yeah. I stopped doing that. I just basically just look at the clock and like, oh, okay, it's eight o'clock. It's eight o'clock. You know, it's like if it's eight o'clock out here, I'm currently in Brazil. Like if it's eight o'clock in Brazil, it's eight o'clock. It's eight o'clock for me, you know? Yeah. So. It's kind of weird, but it really helps me with my sleep pattern. That's actually, I think, a very enlightened perspective because you are where you are, right? <laughs> and you're accepting of it and you're present. It's No, I, I love that. I haven't heard anybody say that yet. I've had one guest say, well, what I do is when I get on the plane, I set my watch for the time zone in which I'll be landing – you know, but they didn't say it this way about like, I don't even do the math of where it is in some other destination, but that's really, that's really brilliant. It also helps probably that I'm most, most of the time I even forget that I'm wearing a watch. So somehow time has transcended into, for me, into this, like I live by my Google calendar. Otherwise I wouldn't get into any of my meetings, but I don't look at my watch anymore. You know, like I don't like actually check time anymore. So probably yeah. that helps too. Yeah. No, that's cool. Okay, next question. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Oh, my God. Um, what was the oh, my God about? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, that, that is a big question. Um, so I think what I did started doing is, and I, I kind of like never really stopped doing it, but I think the number thing, the number one thing you can do to age well is be physically active. Right. And whatever shape or form that takes, if it's like, you know, you go out for a run, you go into the gym, you do whatever, you go dancing, it doesn't matter. Just go and be physically active. It makes a massive difference. And I never really stopped doing it. So it's kind of like not something I really started. But I'm, as I get older, I become more conscious of it. Right. As I get also busier, where it's not like, oh, I can just go to the gym for like three hours. Um, I have made it more of a conscious effort. To say, you know what, like I should really get my ass out there and go hiking or, you know, go running or go to the gym or something. Um, I think that's one. The other one is, um, in my case, um, I mostly stopped eating um, uh, meat. Um, so I'm mostly vegetarian. I still eat it every once in a while when either I have no other choice and or um, I really want it. I really enjoy it. You know, like a good steak here in Brazil, for example, a good steak. Um, but I think I, I find that I feel better. Um, I definitely feel better with, with less meat in my system. Um, and I stopped drinking alcohol. Um, but that's more of a, there was a weird coincidence where I just decided to not drink alcohol for a little while and then never got back into it. Um, but I find what it does to me is, uh, because I'm out there quite often in social engagements, um, there was always a social pressure on me to drink. Not a lot, but like everybody's like, oh, come on, let's have a glass of wine. You know, like let's have a cocktail or something or a glass of whiskey or something. And you end up, you, I, you know, I ended up uh, drinking a decent amount of alcohol. You know, not like excessive or uh, in any way, shape or form probably like bad for me, but still a decent amount of alcohol. And now because I've got a, a strict I don't drink, the funniest thing is that when people come to me and they're like, oh, yeah, come on, let's drink, you know, I can have a glass of wine or something. And they say, oh, I don't drink. They somehow think I'm, I'm, I'm a former uh, alcoholic. Yeah. Which is kind of like, I mean, it's, it's kind of sad and weird and funny at the same time because they look at me and they're like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Should I get you a glass of water? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is good, in particular when I travel. I, I really feel like that the, sh the fact that I don't drink um, – it makes travel easier for me. Yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. I made the decision a few years ago also to quit drinking. Mm -hmm. I just find life works better for me when I don't drink. I think other people appreciate it too, <laughs> to be honest. Yep. But no, I, I hear you. 
Um, okay, next question. What's one thing you wish every American knew? That climate change is real and that the, we need to freaking do something about it like yesterday. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Question number eight. What's the best relationship advice you've ever learned and successfully applied? <laughs> um, the little things matter. I think it's really important to like, you know, I'm married for 14 years. Like, I, I got, we've got a really, my wife and I have a really, I believe, I hope. <laughs> no, I, I know we've got a really amazing relationship. And, you know, we still like write ourselves, like, like when I travel, we write ourselves little like notes, which we like sneak into our uh, briefcases um, or leave on the coffee machine when I leave the house or something. Right? It's like the small things really matter, I think. Um, yeah. And it's easy to to get into like a, a rut where you know like you're just you're just you you are together but you're kind of like just living next to each other somehow. What's the most useful thing you've ever learned about money? Useful or most important? Um, so I wish I would have understood this not mentally understood it but really understood it earlier, which is start saving early like in your 20s. Um, I did not do that, uh, at least not to the extent I should have or could have. Um, it really pays off. It's really important. Uh, there's a thing called compound interest, which uh, saves your bacon in like a big way. <laughs> so I, sh I wish I would have learned that a little earlier. Again, like I knew it intellectually, of course. Um, but it's a whole different thing to then actually live it. Um, you know, I'm fine now. It's fine. But uh, I, I still kick my ass a little for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want to put these two things in here to make sure that I get to them. But I do have a few more questions for you about the creative process and about writing. So the first thing is, as a way of expressing my gratitude to you for making so much time, sharing generously of your experience and your wisdom, um, I've gone on Kiva.org and I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to an entrepreneur in um, Ecuador uh, to a woman. Her, her name is Modesta Andrea. She's going to use this money to buy plates and household items and jewelry that she will sell and improve the quality of life for herself and her family and people in her community. So it's just a small gesture to to say thank That's you. That's amazing. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And then the other thing that I want to make sure to ask here is if people who are listening uh, want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? So the good news is that um, there is actually no other Pascal Finet on this planet. Um, this name is bizarrely so unique um, that if you punch it into uh, the search engine of your choice, um, you will find everything I do, for better or worse. Right. So the nightmare for me is that like nothing I do will ever go like I can <laughs> bury and hide somewhere. It just doesn't work. Um, so the easiest is literally go online, like punch in my name into a search engine. You'll find a ton of resources. Um, uh, if you're interested in anything which is um, related around entrepreneurship, um, subscribe to The Heretic. It's literally at theheretic.org, which is my newsletter. Um, there's a huge archive. There's like I mentioned this earlier, like 1,200 articles or so. Um, you know, some of them are surely better than others. I think some of them are probably relatively insightful. So just check that out. Um, and if you want to stay in touch with uh, the work we're doing, uh, check out um, our company, which is b-radical.today. So be radical today. Um, that's where you find us. Um, and we, we have a, a little newsletter subscription there. We've got a community which we've set up there, etc. So I think those are the good sites. And then there's a ton of video of, of me doing my thing, uh, which you'll find on YouTube. Um, there's a bunch of podcasts I did, so I'm, I'm easy to find. Yeah. Online and in real life, you're very tall. Yes, I am very <laughs> tall. That's true. I'm also skinny. That's, a, that's the other thing. I'm actually, you know, the funny thing is, let me tell you a story. So, uh, sorry, I'm like derailing you here, but like no, you have great. to hear the story because that is the story. Like, I, I, I've told this story so many times. It's really a story of my life. So, I am... Uh, six foot four, six foot five, or 196 in, in metrics. And I'm skinny. Uh, so I'm about uh, 85, sorry, I can't do this in pounds, but I'm about 85 kilos. 
Um, so typically when you see people which are my size, there's more people like my, my size, they're typically broad shouldered, right? They're more like uh, basketball players. So uh, it is unusual for me to see someone who's tall and skinny. I was at Denver airport. I will never forget this. I'm sitting in front of my gate. Opposite me is a guy. He sits and I can see that he's tall, right? You can like, you can eye the people a little bit, right? He's very well dressed in like suit, everything. They call the flight. Um, he gets up and I get up. And um, again, like super nicely dressed. He picks up his bag. And I swear to God, he was literally a head taller than I was. Like, I have no idea, but he was, like, easy, like, you know, c- close to, like, 210 in meters. You know, like, another, whatever, 10 inches taller than I was. And, uh, sorry, 5 to five to 8 inches. And I look at him, and I, I must have looked at him in, like, total disbelief. Because, again, it never happens. He's, like, this skinny guy, like, super <laughs> tall. And he looks down at me and says, there's always someone taller than you. Turns around <laughs> and walks off. And I'm just standing there and I'm like, oh my God, like this is a life lesson. You know, like this is not just like literal. This is not just like figuratively speaking. This is like, oh my God. (laughs) I, so I have no idea who this person is. Like I've, but he just taught me a lesson for my life. There's always someone taller than you. <laughs> it's incredible. Awesome. I love that story because it's yeah. like, you know, I, I just stood there. I literally must have stood there for a minute and not moved. Just like, <laughs> oh, my God. How long ago was this? It's years ago. It's like I was, at this, I was uh, mentoring at Unreasonable and I was on my way back from Unreasonable. And it's like, I don't know, easily five years ago or so. That's but so since funny. then, I've told this story so many times because it's like <laughs> such a beautiful story. That's great. Okay, so coming down the stretch with our last few minutes here, I want to ask you a bit about your experience, your advice, although I don't love advice, what you might suggest to others or encourage others to do who want to, again, who want to do what you've done. They want to share their ideas in writing in a way that actually gets read, that makes a difference for people. So I only have a couple of specific questions, but I think the broad one to open with is just, what do you say to people in that situation? What have you learned that might be useful to others mm-hmm. when it comes to this kind of creative endeavor, sharing in a way that matters? I think, first of all, it, 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 there surely is differences in the type of writing you want to do and you want to put out there, right? So my initial, like, my initial instinct was to write this uh, email newsletter which was literally an email i sent to people um so that has certain limitations right or certain parameters which is it can only be a few paragraphs because it needs to be it needs to fit into an email people don't read like two pages of text and so on and so on um i think that's very different than if you want to write a scholarly article or if you want to write a book even Um, so start out with like figuring out like what kind of writing do you actually want to do and I found that for me, uh, probably because English is, a, is, is my second language, um, so, you know, being German, um, I really gravitated towards the short and the concise. And there's a beauty I find with people who are um, using a language as a second language because their command of the language isn't quite as extended or extensive as, um, you know, a native English speaker. Um, you tend to simplify. And there's beauty in this, right? Because I can take a complex um, concept and simplify it down because, quite frankly, I can't even express it in complex words, right? I don't have the words. So that being said, I think the, the, what I learned with writing 1,200 posts is I can tell you that is I cringe when I read my first posts. I even cringe when I read the book we published, Right? Because I read the book and I'm like, oh my God, did I really write this? This is terrible, <laughs> right? This is like, oh my God, like the grammar isn't quite right. And so there is something which happens when you put yourself out there and just keep doing it. Um, so I think, so advice number one for me is really like practice, practice, practice. And, and practice in a way, not just like write a draft and throw it away, you know, but like write it and put it out there. Um, which requires you to do something you really love and you need to do it for the love of it because 
I guarantee you in the beginning it won't be good and nobody will read it. I, you know, like I remember I, sell, I had this moment where when we set up the newsletter, the newsletter relatively quickly got to like 100 plus people because that's all the people I knew plus like, you know, the, the friends they invited. But then when the newsletter hit the first time, like hit like 500 people, I was like, oh my God, like I'm famous, you know? And then when the his newsletter hit a thousand, I was like ecstatic. Um, and, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like a thousand people is like when, you know, like some Instagram influencers, they don't even fart for like a thousand people, right? So again, like it takes time, find your tribe. I mean, all the stuff Seth Godin writes about, like quite frankly, Seth has it like totally nailed. Um, follow his advice and you're in <laughs> him and uh, Stephen Pressfield like the two of them like if you put them together it's, it's like real magic happens um, yeah but really for me it was about practice because you get really you get so much better um, to the extent that today I can write what I consider a relatively well written newsletter uh, literally in 20 minutes I just sit down I just write a first draft and granted my, my <clears throat> newsletters also don't require a lot of research Right, so I'm not spending a lot of time on researching him. There's basically just a brain dump, but it takes me 20 minutes to write these things. Um, and I also don't have the writer's block anymore. It, like once I've, I've got a topic, I know what I want to write about. I'm just like start writing. So I think those are uh, things I learned at least. Yeah, that that thing about practice and about being willing to put yourself out there. There's something really powerful about that that I think our inner critics will often stop us. I mean, we might practice, but then actually putting it out there, <laughs> knowing that, you know, our first efforts almost always suck. You know, mm -hmm. like you said, it's not going to be any good. Nobody's going to read it. Um, let me ask you this. What, how important to you is routine as a writer? I, I think it's super important. I don't get enough of it just because of my lifestyle. Um, so... My life, my life really changed in the last two years or so where I just got traveling a lot more than I did before, um, which you also can see in the, in the frequency when I publish the newsletter. So I used to publish the newsletter <clears throat> pardon, every two days. And I had a routine. I was, like, I was literally forcing myself, like, write a newsletter every two days. I now still have a, a reminder in my calendar to write a newsletter every two days, but I typically don't write one for 10 days just because I don't have the time. Um, because I need, it's less the time, by the way, to write the thing. It's more the time to actually reflect about a topic and write something which is meaningful and not just like, you know, gibberish. Um, I think routine is super important. I think it's, it's, in, it's super vital. Um, if, if I would not know how to write a book if I wouldn't do it in a very, very structured routine based way you know like you read this about all these like the great writers they get up in the morning and then they sit down and then they write from 8 till 12 right and then they have lunch and so on and i think it's important if you want to if you really want to push put something out there and you want to be a pro like do that let me by the way tell let me tell you an interesting thought sorry i'm going off topic here a little bit but um this is probably helpful so my craft to a certain extent is me being on a stage telling story and, and teaching what the future looks like and teaching the future of business and so on. And I think I'm pretty good at it. I hope I'm pretty good at it. And I spend quite a bit of, I, I invest quite a bit of time and effort into it to make it better, right? So I took years ago, I took um, half a year of improv. Um, I did classic theater, um, all with the knowledge, like I don't want to be a, th I don't want to play Shakespeare, but it helps me to understand how a stage works, how I present myself, and so on and so on. Um, the other day, I watched um, the documentary Homecoming uh, with Beyonce. Um, so this is Beyonce's concert. Um, it's a two-hour documentary about her concert at uh, Coachella, the big festival. Um, and it's kind of like the, it shows you like parts of the festival for performance, but then also shows you all the lead-up. And the lead-up was... Um, about 120 days um, of her practicing with like 200 dancers and the, her musicians and so on, right? And you see this intensity and you see what they're putting into it. And granted, I mean, this is a show of like the highest quality, right? But you look at this 
And then I look at my own practice and I'm like, oh my God, I'm a bloody amateur. And the question I'm asking myself is, and I think this is the important point, is go watch a movie like this or a documentary like this or read a book about this. And then ask yourself, like, what does this, how would this look like if I translate this particular level of intensity and preparation into my work? Because I'm asking myself this at the moment. I'm like, okay, so if my job is to be on a stage and, you know, talk about the future, what is the level of preparation which would match the intensity of what Beyonce puts on stage? Like, because that's world class, right? And the funny thing is, I'm not even a Beyonce fan. But I watched that movie or the documentary. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. And I think this, you know, it goes back to like the writing thing. It's like, so if you want to be a writer, if you really take this serious, like you need to match the intensity of, you know, your, your favorite writers. I really like that perspective a lot. And I think it's a really useful question, you know, to look at somebody who's one of the top performers in the world, in their field, whatever it is, and just to ask you know, not necessarily to compare mm -hmm. yourself against that person, but to just really look inside in a really honest way about yep. what's the unrealized potential I'm leaving untapped within myself. Right. You know, that's really, yeah. And for some reason, as I hear you share that, I mean, it's both inspiring and it's a bit for me intimidating too. It's like, I could see how that could be a disempowering inquiry, but um, I guess we're all we're all unique. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, here's the thing, right? So I keep telling this people. I think there's a there's a there's an important question you need to ask yourself. And uh, um, uh, someone uh, years and years ago, like, used the acronym TYBT to yourself be true. Mm. Um, and I believe it comes out of like some rehab thing. I'm not quite sure, but. Um, the, the to yourself be true question you need to ask yourself is like, how much do you really want it? And I want, I want people to ask that question and answer that question, A, honestly, but also non-judgmental. Because here's the thing which I find, and this is the part where, which, which, which disturbs me, is a lot of people think, they think they need to answer the question with like, oh, I want it like, you know, super hard, I want it with my life, I want to be, right? When in reality, they don't. When in reality, they say, you know, like, I want it, but like, it's okay if it's only that much, right? And that's fine. By all means, that's great. Then do that and save your energy and self your, save your inner critic uh, to do something different, like something else, right? Yeah. This is like this notion in Silicon Valley, we've got this bullshit about, like people building like a lifestyle business, right? Like I just read like an old edition of Wired and there's a story about this kid who created this, um, uh, you know, like you remember these old like time cards which you had to like put into the machine and like make this a like, clock clock, right? So this kid created a time cards app, basically like a, you know, web app and made $10,000 a month with about... You know, they, he said he spends about 20 hours a month on the product, like all in all. Which, which, by the way, and just to interrupt your flow for a moment, that's a perfect example of something I've heard you talk about. Take something physical and yep. make it digital. Yep, and, that's true. Right? That's true too. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll create wealth and, and service yeah. beyond. So yeah. anyway, kind of an interesting example. Yeah, but, no, but I mean, here's the thing, right? So so this kid makes like $10,000, works 20 hours a month. Uh -huh. I mean- and then travels the world. I mean, how, how amazing is that, right? And then he gets panned by some people in Silicon Valley because it's a lifestyle business, because he's not like making the world a better place or changing the world or not wanting it hard enough and so on. And I think that's such bullshit, right? Because like, if you, if you want that and that's what your ambition is and that's what you want, to, that's incredible. More power to you, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And then if you say, if you say, no, actually, I want to be the best software engineer in the world and I want to build the most incredible product in the world. Yes, then you need to watch Beyonce and say, I need to perform at that level. Mm. Right? <laughs> I love and it. And only then. Yeah. I did just watch, my wife and I last night watched uh, Brene Brown on oh, yeah, Netflix. Sure. But I'm going to add to our watch list now. Homecoming. Yeah, yeah, Homecoming is incredible. It's so good. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, last few questions about your creative uh, process. 
So now that you mentioned the thing about being like your craft being the stage, which that doesn't surprise me having watched you. I mean, the first Mm -hmm. time I encountered you was you were on stage, both emceeing and presenting, which somebody with me was saying, I've never seen that. I've never seen an (laughs) emcee be so, so talented. Um, Will you share just a little bit about what does your preparation look like? I think a lot of people listening to this, a lot of people who want to write, they not only want to share their thoughts and and ideas in writing, but they do in fact want to talk and speak publicly, whether it's online or in front of groups. But when you're preparing for a delivery, Mm -hmm. how do you, what's your, what's your approach? How do you Mm -hmm. prepare? So I think there's a couple of components. Um, Some of them are pretty obvious and everybody gets this, like the content, right? Like what do you actually want to talk about? And you try to figure out, um, uh, my view is, it has absolutely nothing to do with what I want to talk about. It has everything to do with what you want to or need to listen to, right? Sometimes what you need to listen to is not what you want to listen to, right? Those are two different things, but you still need to listen to it. Um, it and I, again, like it has nothing to do with me. Like, so um, first of all, figure out your, I think, figure out your content that requires you to understand your audience, right? Like who's in the audience, why are they coming, what are they getting out of it? The one question I ask organizers all the time, um, and I think it's an important one, if you really want to perform. So I think there's a difference between knowledge dissemination, right? I get on stage, I tell you something which is, which is a piece of knowledge, data, data points, etc., models, and I can do that. And then there's another point which is a more, like a more of a performance, right? And then the, my world, the best sessions at least i attend are the ones which bring the two together um so if you want to create a performance or have a performance element in it i think you need to understand this what is the emotion you want to take people uh through and it's a it's a journey right like emotion is not like a singular thing it's not like oh here's a single emotion it's a journey it's a movie it's like uh, for me a stage performance is like i take you with me on a movie like i really think more like a movie director I'm like, okay, let's like get you into this like holy shit and like be a little bit scared and like let me show you it's okay, you know, like cuddle you a little bit and break up the tension with a little joke or funny video or and then like hammer it down again with something which like, you know, after you you like you uh, lost some of the tension, let me now show you something else which kind of like probably frightens you and so on. So I I think a lot about um, the emotional arc and how do I map the content I want to convey to the emotional arc. Um, and the, the best, the funniest example I can give you for this is, um, again, like all wisdom, which has been bestowed on me by other people who are way better than, it is, than it, I am. Um, so this comes straight from uh, Guy Kawasaki. Um, Guy Kawasaki is an author. Um, he used to be the first evangelist for Apple back in 1980, whatever, four. Um, he's a very, very good public speaker. And um, uh, so it's this like Jap- Japanese guy and he gets on stage and he does his thing. And he was at an event um, uh, we organized at Singularity University. And uh, one of our participants asked him, hey, guy, how comes that you're, uh, you're so good? And like, what's your outlook here? And he said, like, first of all, I'm so good because the talk I gave today, I gave 150 times already. He's like, of course you are good at this, right? Like, I don't want to bust your bubble here, right? But like, you know, like you're not special. I just gave this talk 150 times, you know, and you get good at it. But the second thing he said, which I thought was really fascinating, he said, listen, the way I, and and Guy is hilarious. Like you listen to him, you're like, you're laughing and he's making jokes. And, you know, like sometimes you're like, what are you talking about, dude? And it's funny and it's more like comedy. But he made a really good point. He said, listen, here's the thing. We all know and scientists, like science backs backs us up. You will forget most of what I said today. You will never remember this. But what I can do is I can implant in your head this idea that when in 10 years you will be in a meeting, you will say, man, there was this guy who looked like Jackie Chan. I can't remember who it was. Like, it was like, like Jackie Chan. And he made this cool joke about this thing which we should not forget. So that reminds me, never ever forget this thing. Right? <laughs> and he's right. Because the thing is, there is like when you look at the like the science of like uh, of storytelling at least less learning learning is a different story where you really need to have people like actually do the thing right which gets them to learning 
Uh, but the, the science of storytelling is like you need to, uh, yeah, like you take a story and then you attach, like you embed in that story this wisdom, this bit of wisdom, this nugget, and it becomes one unit. Hmm. Right? So I tell you a joke and then right after the joke, I tell you a thing which is related to the joke, but which is actually a learning. Right? That makes you not forget the joke. But you will remember the joke and it doesn't make you forget that the data point. Yeah. So anyway, so that's a, a long-winded answer to uh, really think about the emotional arc when you talk. No, that, that's a next – I think I really do think that's a next level you know, concept for anybody who wants to speak. First of all, I think a lot of people just say, well, here's what I want to talk about. Here's what I'm passionate about. I just want to share it. Uh-huh. You know, but instead, having that audience first orientation, what do they want or need to hear? And then how am I, as the speaker, going to lead them on a journey, an emotional journey, and then map the content of that? I mean, that's really, that's really next level, um, I think, and not obvious to somebody who might just be starting out in this. So I, I suspect there are people who are hearing this that will, be, um, that will find that concept useful, if not a bit still you know, theoretical. They get to play it out in their own yeah, experience right you have to play and and i think that's the other thing which is important to understand is um uh, this comes straight out of the coaching world which is that um humans crave authenticity i can sniff every we are all so finely tuned that we can sniff mild um against the wind if someone is inauthentic which means that if you get on stage and you emulate someone you know, like you're, you get on stage and you're like, oh, I want to be like Steve Jobs, so let me emulate Steve Jobs, right? Or I love the way, you know, like X, Y, and Z presents, so I'm going to do it that way. If it's not authentic, if it's not you, we will sniff this immediately. And then you're inauthentic and we don't connect with you emotionally. Um, so be who you are and own it. I give you an interesting example. It's like uh, a former boss of mine uh, it's just like he's an incredible speaker, super smart, and a massive introvert. So now, as an introvert, you shouldn't be on a stage typically, right? It's like a little awkward. But he went on stage. I remember this very distinctly, where he went on stage, and he owns that he's an introvert, right? So he gets on stage, and the first thing he tells you is a joke, an introvert joke, which is, "What is the difference between an introverted and an extroverted software engineer?" The extroverted software engineers looks at your shoes, right? So everybody's like, he sets the stage. Everybody's like, I mean, even the joke is a little awkward, right? <laughs> but everybody's like, okay, got it. So you're an introvert. You're probably like a massive introvert. So we know what we have to deal here with you, right? And then he just owns it. So he's like, he's like super softly spoken, but he's so intense in his owning his own, like body and physiology and emotion that everybody loves him right so really own who you are and be yourself and not try to be someone else because it just doesn't work yeah no i I think you're absolutely right okay last last two questions sure the the first the penultimate question i don't get to use that word every day (laughs) that's a beautiful (laughs) second second to last question is about if you've had this experience because I think I have, right? Like, look at that, the ontology of, I think I've had this experience. But when you're on stage and you've done the preparation, you know your audience, right? And you're there and you're delivering. And this isn't exclusive to being on stage. I'm sure there's other areas in life where if this happens to you, it probably happens there as well. But do you have this experience of like, something's working through you, whatever, a higher power, life itself, your higher self, you know, something but it's almost like, and maybe it's just just the flow state, but like you disappear and it's almost like you're an instrument, you're being used in service mm-hmm. to something bigger than yourself in that moment. You have that experience yeah, absolutely. sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What's that about? <laughs> I think it's flow. I think it's when you really, so what happens for me is you decouple, um, uh, I think the easiest way to describe this for me is like, I believe that, that mostly we live, we have this like membrane around us, which still like decouples kind of like our head, the brain, the, our thoughts somewhat from our body. It allows us to observe our body, right? Like you've got this like permanent, like observing state, etc. And I, I, what happens for me is like when you get into this, like 
more of a flow state. Um, and I used to, I have this with running when I run long distances as well. After a while, like the, the thoughts just stop and you just become one with your body, right? So I have this in a physical way when I run. Um, I have it on a stage after a little while when I'm in flow, you just like, you kind of like the membrane disappears. And like, it, it feels much more holistic. Like you become much more like one with everything, like with yourself, with your body, with your thought. You're not like actually like, you know, like you don't have voices in your head anymore, you know? Uh, the extreme opposite, by the way, is if you have these out-of-body experiences, which I also have every once in a while. So if for some reason the audience doesn't connect, right? Some Every once in a while you have an audience which just the audience, like for whatever is, whatever is going on for them, um, they just really not connecting. So you kind of like in this moment when you're standing on stage, at least for me, I get like I zoom out of my, I, I literally have an out of body experience where I see myself talking. Really? Like so like yeah. literally you're looking down on yourself. Yeah, you like kind of like, you, yeah, not like physically looking down, but more like a, like a, a holistic view of all of my, everything. But like as if, if I wouldn't be inside of my own shell. You know, mm. yeah, because I hear about that sometimes. With I remember Steve Perry, the guitarist for mm -hmm. Aerosmith, yeah, would yeah. talk about on like guitar solos or in really intense part on a show. Like he would have these out of body experiences. But it sounds like this is maybe a little different because where I think he's very connected, very in the flow state. This is happening right. for you when you're not. That's correct. Yes, for me, the opposite is is the exact opposite, right? So the the one is like the the membrane becomes much thicker, and suddenly uh, you become painfully aware of like everything about you right like mm. wait a second like my shoulder is a little backwards my feet stand a little weird like i mm. should probably like turn my hip a little bit more to the audience right whatever it is right and then the other one is like if you're in flow for me it's like i just feel it i don't feel anything anymore right i'm just like yeah. this like unit it's beautiful it's a really it, nice it, state to be in it is beautiful it is beautiful like i i, I long for that experience and do yep. do a lot to create that so Okay, so the last question, and thank, thank you for sharing that. I know these are the kinds of things, at least I don't talk about every day, but I'm always fascinated to explore them with, with others who I suspect have had them as well. So it's probably all of us. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to ask you in this interview is it's about, so you mentioned stories, telling stories a few times throughout this, and clearly their stories have the potential to be very, very powerful. My experience is sometimes telling stories can be very challenging when it comes to writing them down and including them in a larger work like the book maybe that you're working on, The Future of Business. Mm -hmm. What experience do you have that might benefit others when it comes to telling a story in writing as opposed to telling it from a stage? Hmm. Interesting. Let me answer this in a slightly unconventional way, but it's an interesting, interesting way to think about this. There is a, uh, there's an app, um, it exists on the Mac, and I believe it exists online, called Hemingway. It's a writer's editor. Um, what Hemingway does is, um, it analyzes your sentence structure, and then basically highlights sentences it deems as too complex, um, or which have conjectures, or we use too many adjectives, or, and so on and so on. So it kind of like shows you the, the defects in your writing, in terms of mostly in terms of clarity what i found since so i've been using hemingway for a while um and what i found is interesting with hemingway is hemingway forces you to use um a relatively speaking very simple sentence structure so very short very concise structures it's of course i mean that it got its name from basically being inspired by the writing of the great hemingway and if you read Hemingway, Hemingway uses like not very complex sentence structures. Like they're really, I mean, they're very carefully crafted sentences, right? And I think the strength of his poetry is the fact that he has the ability to, uh, to write these incredibly deep works by using short sentences, by very carefully picking the words in the sentences and the structure of them. So what this app did for me is it shifted my, my writing. So I used to write very German, which is long sentences, you know, like 15 commas and like conjectures in there and, you know, like all this stuff, which is a typical German way to write. And I translated this into English, right? So I, I used the same 
ideas on how to construct a sentence into my English writing. What I've since learned with Hemingway is that my writing has become significantly more shorter and concise. And I find this particularly interesting if you tell stories. Mm. That is to say, uh, if you're writing stories down, I think there might be a, a really powerful uh, notion around trying to write story in a um, in in very concise, short, precise sentences. Um, get a get a good thesaurus, or like use a good online thesaurus. Um, that's a, the other power tool I love using. It's like even if I never, even if I don't like end up copying words out of it. Like the sheer fact of like punching in a word and seeing like what are other words which are similar, you know, yeah. is so powerful. It's so interesting. Um, so yeah, so my my secret weapon is Hemingway, and then combined with a good uh, thesaurus. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. I, def- I haven't heard of Hemingway before. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, it's a little obscure thing, but it's it's really good. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Well, that those are all the questions that I have for you. I'm sure I'll think of three more when I'm on my drive home. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but thank you for, again, thank you so much for spending so much time and, and sharing. Uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you have as well. It was awesome, Brian. Thank you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education or who live in conflict zones. There's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at briamiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com. 